Hear ye, hear ye! The Parliament of Geek shall now come to order! And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the sophomore episode of the Parliament of Geeks. The, pl the one place where the, Ill where the best of us within, our within these holy walls come to deliberate whether so come to deliberate one particular question in the and I will let as always good brother Zan take that question away that question is very simple all our friends amongst the world we take your favorite media and our own we take it observe it scrutinize and the question remains be it weeb or be it scrub <laughs> very, very much so. And don't worry, as the, as things goes on, we will develop a bit of a rhythm with the opening. Just yeah. cut us some slack. This is our second time doing this shit. Right? <laughs> We're still new at this, folks. This is a whole new territory for us. Mm -hmm. So Everything's new at some point. It's true. Last time we did this, we w we covered something that was definitely on the lighter end of storytelling. Definitely something that had its far more comedic moments. For this one, we're going in a bit of the opposite direction, and it is a, it is a case of the of a certain project that most streaming services don't want you to watch. We'll get into oh. that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But it is de it is definitely one of the hidden gems of the early two thousands, especially give especially given my love for the output of ADV films. So a thing that I have made very clear over the years. That I'm pretty and I'm pretty sure Cartoon Boy can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and yes, now that I've heard that nickname, I'm not letting it go. But for this for this week we we venture away from away from away from something more European based and into the and into the rest recesses of Japanese history because our sub because our subject this week is Samurai X Trust and Betrayal. But before we even get into that. There is one other tradition that we need that we need to cover. So ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our drinking anthem. School School It's time to sound the horn! Now, this is a this is a curious beast, largely because of the fact that Samurai X is not the proper name that it should be going under, but we used it for the sake of convenience. Since the other name is, if the art didn't give it away to, to a point, is Rironi Kenshin Suyokuken. And I know I mispronounced that, and my apologies for that. Suyokuken. Yeah. Now, Rironi Kenshin is an anime that needs no introduction. And, ha and has been one of my all-time favorite shonen um, anime and manga for quite some time. Um, final arc of the anime notwithstanding because it wasn't the arc that people asked for. We don't talk about that. No. And of course of course uh, of course the live ac the live action takes have been one of the rare cases of a live action anime actually working, but as I stated on the Geek Watch episode discussing live action anime, that's ki it's kind of cheating to consider that one an exception to the rule because 
it's easy it's easy to do it's easy to do a live action adaptation of an anime that's taking a lot from Japanese history. So you can just call up pe people who do period dramas and half the work's done. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think Rurouni Kenshin probably also owed itself to a live action adaptation more easily because barring the quote unquote apparent godlike ability of his batojutsu, um Nearly all of the combat in Rurouni Kenshin is not so bombastic it can only be done in in animation. You could very easily use some either practical or CG effects to to achieve things like uh, the Futai no Kiwami or uh, the Amakakeru Ryu no Hirameki. Mm -hmm. That being said, that being said. For the for those those t those who are Toku aficionados, there is one more there is one more reason to give high marks to the um, Roni Kenshin film trilogy. That being that Kenshin Hirura is played by Takeru Sato. Takeru a Sato, aka Common Rider Deno himself, the actual Deno, not just the Taros in in his suit. Mm -hmm. Also known as the unluckiest man in Japan. <laughs> Which, when you think about how Kenshin is in the actual series, it makes perfect sense for for Sato to play him because th to go from goofy and silly to badass was kind of Takeru Sato's specialty. Mm -hmm. Oh, that being that being said, trust and betrayal can be considered a prequel. One might the. Pit, the elevator pitch that a lot of people give with the, with this particular um, four episode OVA series is how Kenshin got his scar. But Which is underselling it. It's, it's based on what's called the remembrance arc of the manga. Yeah. So. And while that's while that's certainly accurate, it is selling the events quite a bit short. And the thing the thing is um. You know how I've you know how I've been very harsh on the phrase it's not the destination it's the journey. Yes. With covering a prequel, the uh, the journey should be more emphasized because you know how the story is going to end, in some in some form at least. Yeah. So, so making sure that making sure that the journey that the journey adds some new context to the character who you're seeing their past of um, certainly makes sense. I'm trying to, to, to give a sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I actually had a good comparison of a, of a prequel series that did not succeed at this and completely damaged the franchise as a whole as a result. The Star Wars prequels. Yeah, and as as much as I have problems with it, there is one, there is one shown in anime I can I can think of that at least ha at least had a better attempt than the Star Wars prequels. Though that's not exactly saying much. Low bar. <laughs> that is the that is a short ar a short arc in Naruto that folk that focused on on uh, Kakashi, which was also the same arc in the manga, just slightly stretched out. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I'd also like to say the only bar lower for ruining the reputation and prestige of Star Wars than the prequels is the sequels. As bad well, as the yeah, prequels but... were, at least they are interestingly bad. And the prequel memes um, Twitter account is a sort is a source of continuous entertainment. Indeed. But the key thing is th is that it is is that it is exploring a, is exploring a mystery that gives greater context to a given character. The importance of the remembrance arc in in the manga was to give further context to the arc that was going to be coming later on, the Jinchu arc. Ah, the Jinchu arc. The best arc that we never got to see animated, except for one OVA we're not going to be talking about. 
ever. <laughs> we don't talk about that OVA. It doesn't exist. Even what Watsky OVA? didn't. Even Watsky didn't like it. But the the type of underpinning that this particular OVA has is not just to explain uh, why he got his scar. Because again, that like we said, that's underselling it greatly. Oh yeah. Um, you, for 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 one fan to say that to another fan of Roni Kenshin makes perfect sense. The fans of Roni Kenshin understand the significance of Kenshin's scars. Mm-hmm. So yeah. selling the prequel as how Kenshin got his scars has a whole lot more emotional underpinning for a fan of the series. Trying to sell it to someone who's never seen it by saying it's how Kenshin got his scars, they're going to look at you like, how is that important? Yeah, no. If you really want to sell this prequel OVA, you you show why it's about why Kenshin became the man he is at the beginning of the series. Why he gave up his need to kill. Why he basically denounces his old title as Hitakiri Batosai. Mm-hmm. However, unlike unlike a lot unlike a lot of um, of shonen works that are, that are that are purely in the fantastical area of things, Roroni Kenshin is a hist- is an act of historical fantasy, and tries to and tries to integrate historical fi- historical figures in Japanese history. With it within its narrative, so it would be remiss of us if we didn't bring that up when it comes to the context of what Japan was at the time in the time of Kenshin's young life. I I'd, I'd like to revise that just a bit. It's not really fantasy, just more general historical fiction. It doesn't really have the same elements that you expect from something that is fantastical many the, Rironi Kenshin in general is very grounded in uh, a a reality that is much like our own because it is grounded in history um, like I said certain super moves notwithstanding and even then those super moves are not as bombastic as say well any shonen battle anime currently running yeah, like um, everything about it is just a fancy attack, not a super bla- super mega bla- death blast. I mean, even uh, even Sonosuke when he wields the 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 Zanbato, um, it, Kenjin even notices he can only really cut with it in two directions because of how big it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so uh, it's very much more historical fiction than historical fantasy. Uh, just just a small small correction. Yeah. That being said, I think this is as good a time as any to explore the point of, the point of history that you, that we're dealing that we're dealing with. So this is the this is the the burning embers, the beginning of the Satsuma Choshu Alliance at the beginning of the Boshin War. Uh, the war that would eventually lead to the Meiji Restoration of Japan, where the Tokugawa Shogunate is finally uh, brought down, and the emperor, uh, posthumous name Meiji, thus his era name, uh, is put back in power. So it's a, it, it's very much it it's a story that since it takes place nearly three hundred years after the Tokugawas took over in 1600. Uh, it's very much just like you, you were in Sengoku Jidai all over again, with the additional complications of technology brought in from outside sources, such as from Americans who forced the country back open in the first place, and from other European nations coming in and trading again. It it has uh, the feeling of, of a war story but a much more modern war story with some still very archaic means of fighting. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, this was this was a time of constant of constant strife. Even though even though the even though the 
that a degree of peace was established when the to when the Tokugawa shogunate took power. It was a peace with a mass with a massive set of asterisks. Well, and the the peace was kept like, like I said for nearly three hundred years. Um, it's only really near the end after U.S. gunboats came over and said, "Okay, you're gonna trade with us, or we're just gonna shell you until you trade with trade with us." Mm -hmm. U.S. is assholes. Remember that. Everybody's assholes. All countries yeah, say, are assholes. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, proof that the U United States of America, we are just a bunch of jackasses. Everybody's we assholes. Fuck everything up. Everybody's assholes. Nobody gets away from that. Everybody wants something, and, and people will do what they want to get it. Mm -hmm. But that's regardless. Uh, it's really when the U.S. came in and started forcing that type of stuff that uh, so the, the Choshu Satsuma Alliance or the Sacho Alliance for short, Sacho Dome, um, comes in because they really don't like that trade's reopened and that it's primarily their port cities that are being used for trade as a sort of quarantine area, and that they're forced to accommodate these foreign people. Um, <laughs> and this now ties into the long-standing Japanese history of xenophobia, but that's, again, irrelevant. The... <sighs> The sparks of war really start as these two clans both uh, discreetly and uh, covertly attempt to undermine uh, the shogunate and the Shinsengumi, the shogunate's basically military police that police the land. They also overtly try to do so by waging an actual war. Mm -hmm. Any of you have played Total War Samurai 2, well, you've played the Sacho Alliance 4. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's, it's a period of unrest at the very end of a regime change, which, let's be honest, every regime change in history has been followed by a period... or preceded and sometimes even followed by a period of unrest... One need look no further than how many times the Chinese kingdoms broke up and reformed in ancient history to find that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill Wirtz is really educational. <laughs> but I'd, ra I'd, rather sa I'd rather save that for the day that, w the day that we cover something like Kingdom. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the, the whole war is... These people who think that the the uh, shogunate is bending over too much for foreigners, which, uh, quick note, even restoring the emperor didn't stop America from going with, yeah, you're, you're still trading with us. All you did was trade out one master for another, and it didn't affect what we're doing at all. <laughs> if, any, if, anything, tra if anything, in the Meiji era trade... Um accelerated accelerated but that's also because you know we demonstrated how useful things like electricity and gunpowder were mm -hmm. i think that might have a small 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 reason to do with it there the other um, thing that probably didn't help it that probably didn't hurt matters is some of the people involved with trading making fat stacks of cash of course yep people will people will do the dumbest things for money or in, the, in this case, the smart in this case the smartest things because well let let's be honest, if if one clan said no we're not going to trade with you, well then they could just go to another clan that might. <laughs> not only, not only that, um, <laughs> because of how the economics of the specific of the of the clans were at the time, and the fact that there. Even prior to the actual warring unrest, there was uh, a bit of there was a bit of a of a lack of material resources, um, and of course, you know, all the quote unquote trading, which some people even thought of as tithes to the Americans, uh, British, and Russians. Um, there, there was a bit of a squeeze around the belts of Japan at that time. Mm-hmm. Make people hungry enough, they will fight. 
how but the re the reason why we're going into the into this bit of history lesson when it comes when it comes to when it comes to Japan is because that sets the backdrop for the story that is in front of us and everything more or less begins not with Ke not with Kenshin but with a little boy named Shinta and ah uh. And the d the day when his the day when his life as Shinta ended, because it did it didn't take it didn't take long before the people he was tra he was traveling with got attacked by bandits, got slaughtered, and this is a good point to, to bring up that while Roroni Kenshin is very is very much in the realm of a show of a shonen series. Trust and betrayal leans far more into seinen regarding how graphic it can get. Mm -hmm. Anything that you saw in the original anime, the TV anime, expect about five or six times worse when it comes to battle damage. We'll say. Oh of, yeah, they they don't hold back on this one. A lot of it is due to the advantages of being an OVA instead of a TV anime. Yeah, you don't have to worry about those damn standards and practices bullshit. Yes, even Japan has those. If you if you need a case in point when it comes to standards and practices, just look at Cowboy Bebop's Japanese run. <laughs> if you need a case in point for standards and practices, the entire reason that the, that tentacle hentai was invented was to circumvent the standards and practices having to do with male genitalia penetrating female genitalia. He's not kidding, folks. That's a thing. Tentacles aren't dicks, so they so they bypass the filter. Just remember, folks, modern problems require modern solutions. <laughs> ah, another Chappelle's Cho joke. I love it. But one would one would think that this would be the end of his story. Another case of of a of a bandit raid, which was which was all too common in those days. Instead, that is not what happened because of one man who who happened to be in the same area. That being Seichiro Hiko, the man who the the man who who um at the t who at that time was the was the current master of Hiten Mitsurugi, and would be the one to tra to train Shinta and even given him give him his name. Because, although the, the um, this is where there's some interesting things regarding the translation that kind of that kind of get lost, and it's not a bad localization for for the time or even now, but there are little details that kind of get lost. Yeah, it's kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to these. One of one of them is Hiko come comes back to the scene of what happened, only to find that. The that um that that Kent that um Shinta had had set up had set up graves for everyone, including three women who 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 treated him, who treated him like he was their little brother. Um, Sakura, Kasumi, and Akane. Even though he had only known them for a few days, because his parents died. Uh, his parents had had died when he was young. In the in in the sub in the sub version, it's stated that they died of cholera, and he was he was found by slave traders and and was just going and ended up going through the trade. Then the bandits came along, and you know how that goes. But yep. there's two. But there's two. Per, there's two particular um two particular monologues in the in. This particular moment that I find I find kind of interesting for the events to come. One of them is one of those women tell, telling him telling him to live. The other is Shinta lamenting that he doesn't ha that he doesn't have flowers for them. And I like I like to look at the, I like to look at that as kind of kind of a taste for some of the motifs to come about how fragile about the fragility of life. Mm. 
And of course, the whole thing of Seichiro pouring um, sake on the on the graves has his own tribute. In the because and, no one should die without tasting good sake. <laughs> and, his own words, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, give be, afterwards deeming that the name Shinta is too soft of a name for a swordsman, and t and tells him from now on you are Kenshin. And there is a bit of a jump forward after this to Ke to Kenshin's days as an assassin, and we kind of get in it kind of we kind of have a bit of timeline jumping, which I know some people aren't fo aren't fond of that, but I look at it as piecing the story in re piecing the story in reverse or using flashbacks to provide better context. We, we, in this case, we get to see what. Kenshin, the now Kenshin has become, and it makes you wonder, like, how did he go from that scared little boy to this? And then when you go back and see the flashbacks of him going through the training and what, why he ended up joining this particular band of assassins, that's when you start to. That's when it's like, oh, now it makes sense. The something I do want to point out when it comes to the when it comes to Kenshin's voice actor in this is that while some people may know Kenshin as the as a, as the goof who can occasionally be serious, um, in his younger days he al he almost comes off like a machine. Mm. Which, given the given the level of skill that he has, certainly makes sense. Oh, but there's two fl there's two flashbacks in particular that ca that. And that end up hint, end up hinting at th at things. One is the t the time that the the time where an older Kenshin ends up um, arguing with his master about the state of things. And the thing about this particular argument is both of them are right. There is the there is the fact that a lot of atrocities were com were committed because because of the because of the alliance of Bakufu. That much that much is true. But Seichiro is is also is also right that all that if you that all you'd be doing if you ju if you jump in there is you'd be pi you'd be picking one side as right and one side is wrong and ki and no matter which side you pick you're still going to be killing people you'll still be a murderer i believe were the exact words yeah which is is actually the best way to describe it because it's it's yeah you might it might be killing for the right reasons and even if that's true you're still killing people mm -hmm. and that that he Seichiro was definitely somebody who appreciated the value of life, even though he was a swordsman. He didn't kill unless he felt he needed to. He didn't kill indiscriminately, yeah. Yeah. And the uh, I'd say the I'd say the other um the other bit of the other flashback that is that is worth noting, especially given the further context, is when he is when he gets the attention of Katsura after somehow making his way in making his way into the Kihei Tai. Which were which were a real thing which the Kihei Tai were a real thing. And Katsura approaches him after seeing him after seeing him slice slice the tra the training wood Ver, um, just like it's nothing. Eve, <laughs> which is kind is kind of amusing. Where there is that where there is that nickname of the Phantom Chief of our ghostly army. Yep. Uh, but he ends up he ends up speaking with him, and he get and he tells him that he's at that he's asking him to kill for him. I .e. we're trying to make a better world, but in order to do that, there are men who must die. And even though even though Kenshin becomes a very efficient assassin, um, 
Katsura wasn't completely pleased. He had, he had said that he's re that even with everything, all the killing that he's done, he remains exactly the same. Further going on the, fa the fact that um, Seichiro had called Kenshin pure of heart, but so are fools. Yeah, he basically equated Kenshin to a child who just did not who did not grow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 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 biggest thing is that uh, Katsura notes with this is that one day the juxtaposition will mark him one day his actions will come to home and the demon will consume him and i think the, i think the other thing that's very telling on this fr on this front is something that is something that his friends said when it came to when it came to ha when it came to handing the young kenshin to him I believe I believe his words were let him absorb the horrors of our struggle and keep yourself pure. Give me your word you will never draw your sword again. Yeah, his friend that had tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And he did um, he did agree to that. And he even agreed to that all the way to the end as we see at the very end of the OVA. Which is yeah. which which is why some of the some of the talks w within the cl within the clan, um, especially when they go sour, it it puts a little bit more weight when he's when there was the when there's that remark of Katsura almost drew his sword. Mm -hmm. We don't see it, but hearing but hearing that fact and the fact that he was so, that he was so willing to up uh, to abandon you abandon drawing his his sword again, um, gives a bit of context because. The thing, the thing is, with the fir with the first half of of the of this OVA series, we we are being told of bit of much bigger events happening around happening around the cast, but we're only getting a small perspective of it. Which, if we wanted to get the larger perspective, we could literally just read the history books mm -hmm. because it is, as we said, this is a historical fiction. The events that they are discussing are events that actually occurred. Or at least yeah, the this, broader events. This movie is simply that whole period, but from the perspective of Kenshin. What his involvement, what his actions did to affect this whole uh, situation. And I know, I know that we've harped on the whole, tel the whole telling instead of showing thing in the past, like on Sunday... But I don't think that applies here, largely because of the fact that this is still Kenshin's story. It's just that we're seeing that the events around the events around him are a powder keg waiting to go off, quite literally. Yeah, when it comes to Kenshin's actions and Kenshin's story in this, they show. It's only the stuff that's happening around them that they tell us about because it's not something that they really felt needed to be animated to give the full context. Mm -hmm. And what what is very what is kind of kind of interesting and speaks to how Kenshin acts acts at this time is he's given he's given an opportunity to act as Katsura's adjunct for one for one of the meetings which which within the with the um higher ups within the clan and he flat out refuses to do it Say, saying that the only way he can ser he can serve him is as an assassin which at that point does make does fit because he was not he was not a protector he was not, and he was definitely not someone who could handle diplomacy. So there was no reason for him to be there, since all he knew to do was to kill. Now the closest but, thing, the closest thing that he has to a friend at this point is Izuka, who's less of a friend and more of his handler, more of the cleanup yeah. guy. Yeah. Kat but but you can also see it from Katsura's perspective. He was trying to slowly break Kenshin out of that shell. Show him there's a larger world besides just killing people. 
and he needed to learn that. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. The, of course, it does. The I'd say the the real plot ends up st ends up starting with two things. One, um, him get him getting attacked by eff effectively a ninja. Yeah, but there's something that comes before that that mm -hmm. I think we uh, have to acknowledge as the bigger starting point. What would you what would you say that what would you say that'd be? One particular assassination job that sets a lot of events in motion. Oh yeah, the assass the assassination of Jubei Shijekura. You're a Cyloning monk. God damn it, not again. <laughs> Am I still Cyloning? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> this shit again. I really hate technology sometimes. Don't we all? What's 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 your uh what's your catchphrase there that you stole from someone else, Shades? Technology! It likes to give us the middle finger. That being what I was saying before Discord rudely interrupted me was the assassination of Jubei Shijekura and his bodyguards. More specifically, a bodyguard by the name of, Ak of Akira Kiyosato. Mm -hmm. Who, even though he knew he was completely outmatched, still kept, still kept trying to fight and did manage to land a wound on him. One which, nev one which occasionally would bleed. For no reason. And... Izuka lays out a bit of a, um, a a bit of a ch a bit of a Chekhov's gun in sa in saying that the that the wound is 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 a after death curse, which is why it doesn't want to heal, and then brushing it off as just an old wives' tale. But the resentment of his opponent, mm -hmm. the resentment of his of his opponent, as it were. Yeah. Basically, whenever Kenshin would get into that killing mood, the wound would reopen. Mm-hmm. And the the um that that particular that particular wound would be would be a would be a recurring thing throughout. Now. Getting getting back to, getting back to things when it came you had the, you had um at the end at the end of the first episode you have the attack ag against him from a full a full on assassin like he is instead instead of say Shinsen Gumi who which he thought which he thought at first mm -hmm. one who decided to chain his swords to, his swords together. I guess so. I guess so that he didn't have to bring along a Kusari Gama or something like that. Or maybe he's related to Fighter, and likes sword chucks. <laughs> <laughs> but one, but it, but even though it's a harder fight than the than the fights you've seen Kenshin have up to that point, eventually the win is through long division. <laughs> and this rev this reveals two particular this is the start of two particular plot threads. And in fact, I said th I said this is the beginning of the this is the beginning of the end. Um first is meeting to meeting Tomoe. And se and second as l later on of the po the possibility of a traitor, because Katsura and company have gone to great lengths to conceal his identity. Yeah, he wasn't out assassinating a person, which they first assumed. They're like, "Were you out killing without us telling you who to kill?" He's like, "No, <clears throat> I was just oh, walking I... back with my umbrella." Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so, yeah, because he was specifically targeted. That's how they knew someone ratted him out. They speculate that it was that it was a ninja from the Niwabanshu clan. 
which is the funny th the funny thing is is that um is that for throughout the throughout the first half this is the only out and out ninja that you see which i think i think further i think further helps illustrate the point that this is that some sending somebody like that is very much out of the ordinary, even for assassins. Well, and at that point in Japanese history, ninjas were an archaic, uh, uh, you know, they, they were an anachronism. Mm -hmm. They, uh, assassins didn't need to be secretive, clannish, and, and uh, hidden. Assassins just needed to be skilled. As we see from the few the few assassinations Kenshin makes, he doesn't try to really hide his presence at all. He announces himself, says, "Hey, you're X Y Z," and they go, "Oh no, it's an assassin!" And then he just kills everybody there. Yeah. And then Iz and then Izuka cleans up cleans up the mess and leaves and leaves a note, pro probably probably with who, probably with who's claiming responsibility. Yep. And of course, the Shinsengumi get pissed off every time that happens. Mm -hmm. But it's but because because of the fact that they that whoever that said ninja knew to target him, the the conclusion is there's a tra there's a traitor in there's a traitor in the ranks. Yep, because no one would know who it was other than someone in the ranks. Mm -hmm. And um, I am glad that the, I'm glad that this anime did not come out. It did not come out in this in current year because, um, you know, somebody would have made Among Us memes over this. Uh, now you've suggested it, Monk. You spoke it into the world. If this occurs, it's your fault. I will. Yeah, like a rake. <laughs> I completely forgot that you had that button. <laughs> I think this calls for a sideshow Bob, doesn't it? Oh, my friend, give me a second. I know I have that right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Regardless, yes. Um, if it were made in current year, current memes would affect it. Absolutely. That be that being said, um, you do the in, one would one would um one would very much think that Tom that Tomoe is is the spy early on, but they I'd say they do a there's a good job here of throwing of throwing that particular trail off, given what Izuka reveals, namely Actually, that she go ahead. Actually, here's the thing. How could she be the traitor? She didn't join until that assassination attempt. She couldn't have known anything about Henshin until that very moment when he was already being targeted. Mm -hmm. So it couldn't have been her. And the other, the other thing that did, the other thing that doesn't exactly help is Izuka did his own investigating and found out a whole lot of nothing. You mean when he stuck his dick in every hole in the city? He was going <laughs> to do that anyways. Yes. He, he just used it as an excuse to do what he was already planning to do. Exactly. He couldn't find anything when it came to when it came to family registries. And when it came to the whorehouses, no luck there. There was the suggestion of a of an alias and it's like I would have figured that out if that if that was the case. If her name wasn't actually Tomoe. Mm -hmm. So basically, what they concluded was, she's not even from this fucking city. Yeah. Which, you know what? Was actually correct. The only things that they were able to find out is that she, ha is that she clearly has some education. Enough that she can still have a very beautiful umbrella. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of a lot of what ha a lot of what happens in in lar in large sections of the of se of several parts of the of the OVA is 
a lot of setting the scene before 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 the powder keg goes off and in this case the thing that go the thing the going off is two things one um the two ma the two major factions within the clan effectively bur have effectively burned their bridge because one of them was d was dumb enough to think hey what's what's a great thing to do for the revolution burn kyoto to the ground and the other one was like, "Are you fucking high?" Mm -hmm. And then it didn't they do it anyway? <laughs> it happened as collateral when the fighting started. Yeah, but the, but you know it was it was the Choshu guys, mm -hmm. the the Bakfu who were just like, "Hey, eh, we're here already. Might as well just you know set this on fire." Yeah, and. Of course, of course, Katsuro ha was look was looking at that and going, "That's fu that's fucking retarded." Yes, and this Kats is one Katsuro of, was unhappy. This is one of those cases where the tr where the translation gets gets it mostly right, but misses a bit but misses a bit of context because at one at one point he mentions that he can't taste the sake, and his consort asks if something's wrong because. That's another Chekhov's gun that's set up. If so, if um, if you can't taste sake, that some, then something's wrong with you. And he said, when asked, he says, "Against evil men, the str the struggle will never end." Which is certainly apropos, but it completely skips the fact that he's that he's lamenting how ridiculous of an of a suggestion it is to burn Kyoto. Mm -hmm. Suggesting that even that not only are the Shinsengumi and the Shogunate evil men, but so too are some of the people in his own clan and uh, among his own comrades, evil men for suggesting to burn down Yoto. Yeah, I should. If it seems like I'm jumping around, it's because there's a lot of there's a lot of um, setting up Chekhov's gun with certain themes in the first two episodes. Another major one is the idea of a sheath. Bow chicka bow bow all you want, people. <laughs> no, that is yeah. Make the jokes all you want, but the real point of a sheath in this case is someone who allows an assassin to put their sword away, metaphorically speaking. Mm -hmm. Not just an assassin, any warrior, because uh, Katsuda's friend. What's his name? It starts with an ooh sound. The guy with the tuberculosis. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> he he has a woman who is his sheath, as Katsura describes him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, um, but my point was still standing. It allows a swordsman to no longer have to to temporarily, when the need is not when it is not needed, to put away their need to kill. Their that's need to fight. That's that's part of it. Um, I think that. What's missed here is all the subtext behind sheathing and unsheathing swords in Japanese culture in general. Mm -hmm. A sword should never be unsheathed unless you're going to use it. Period. End of story. That was that was not just a practical argument. Um, as Bushido became this sort of affectation of nobility during the Tokugawa shogunate. And let's be honest here, everybody says, oh, the samurai always fought honorably in Bushido and all that. No, no, no. Bushido was what they used during civil times and in duels with each other. Bushido, um, you're an Ashigaru foot soldier with a pike? Fuck Bushido, I'm going to cut you down on my horse with whatever I want. Or I'm going to throw dirt in your eyes and kill you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. This is not a battle for honor at this point, this is war. Um, the Samurai knew how to knew, knew how to separate the two the in name, many the different ways. The name that you're thinking of when it comes to Katsura's friend is Takasugi. I just yes. remembered. Takasugi, that guy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. He uh. The the, but the ideal in Bushido is the reason you don't unsheath a sword, not just because of the practical effect, is also the spiritual effect, because Bushido did begin focusing on the inner spirit of any swordsman of any samurai it unsheathing the sword 
was you bearing your fangs at the world. And you did not do that unless you intended to take a fucking bite. Mm-hmm. Um, so this idea of sheathing their murderous intent, while a practical one in the way it's portrayed in the show, is still also a spiritual one, and it plays out really subtly, that I li- and I like how it plays out subtly, but it's a subtext missed by people who understand little to nothing about Japanese culture. Mm-hmm. And these, day- these days we call those people Twitter users. Oh! <laughs> Man, I, if I could go into every time... Okay, if I had a nickel for every time Twitter users mis- misappropriated or misunderstood Japanese culture, I would be richer than God. <laughs> He's not wrong. However, getting ba- getting back on the r- getting back on the rails, the culmination of a lo- of a lot of this, the powder keg that I referred to earlier, is when right in the right in the middle of, of a festival, one w- one which in the precursor to um, Tomoe ends up co- ends up calling out the fact that Kenshin ha- Kenshin has deferred other- deferred his targets to other people. And essentially saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> the Shinsengumi declare that they're going to be doing a raid. Ah, uh, because because they be on on several inns where they where they suspect where they suspect patriots are going are gathering. Patriots being a shorthand for the for um those in opposition to the shogunate. Mm-hmm. And this isn't a case of this. And because of the because of the fact we just because of the fact that the Shinsengumi were basically the shogunate's police, one would one would think that they, that this would mean that those people would be arrested. No. <laughs> when I say police, I mean more like the judges in 2000 AD. The Shinsengumi were judge, jury, and executioner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the Shinsengumi. Um... If you want to compare them to any governmental military police force in all of the world, I have a word for you. It's a very famous word. It's a word not a lot of people like. Gestapo. They were an open Gestapo. They weren't hidden. They fucking paraded around towns in their nice haori, all shinsengumi'd up. You knew who shinsengumi was because they were parading it made a lot of people who weren't the Shinsengumi, and even people who were other samurai, very uncomfortable and unhappy. Even even um, Izuka has that remark of, 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 of a bit of contempt just going, look at them, like they own the place. Exactly. Because at the time, they practically did. Mm-hmm. Well, and the Tokugawa shogunate did a lot of good things for Japan, but... Um, for those of you who have all watched the the, me, the meme-filled fantastic uh, video that is Bill Wirt's History of Japan, I guess, it was very strict. It clo- Like I said, it closed the country down to all outside trade except for a tiny bit of Portuguese and Dutch at like four ports total. Again, over in where Satsuma and Choshu clans would later build their power bases Mm -hmm. and the tokugawa shogunate because tokugawa and uh, iyasu tokugawa and his descendants were actually very smart in many ways um ruled with the stick and the carrot very well but the stick was always like a thick oak rod not something you'd just pull up from the side of the road they'd beat you if you needed to be Eaten. So the Shinsen Gumi just killing stick. them. It, it, basically, it wasn't just a stick. They cut a switch on your ass. <laughs> More like yeah. A... And with within the, within this raid, this also intru- this is also a good time to talk about two particular characters who make appearances, but are but would become much bigger deals in the greater Kenshin series. Well, one of one of them would. 
Saito. Yep, Sa Saito. Aksoku-zan himself. Aksoku-zan. Mm -hmm. Slay evil swiftly. Or, if you get even more literal, evil swiftness slash. The other He's being um, Okita, who's... Ba who's basically his lieutenant at this at this juncture, and who wants to, for some absolutely retarded reason, pit himself against Kenshin. Oh yeah, like like he's his whole thing is like, oh the assassin was here. It's that one assassin, the assassin we're always hearing about. That assassin, assassin, assassin. I want to face him down. Not even scared for his own life. I swear that kid had no survival instinct. None. He also seems to. He also seems to be far more impressed with. I think it. I think it was more of, um, a lethal amount of curiosity regarding his technique after seeing the res the the exactness of the results. Mm-hmm. Because they they pull up they pull a bit at one point they pull a bit of a Boondock Saints, and. And recre and recreate one of the one of the uh, one of the attacks when Kenshin and Izuka got ambushed by the Shinsengumi. Yeah, um, it's it's good to note that um, Okita also suffered from tuberculosis. Although 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 at that point clearly not as severe, clearly not as severe because you don't see him coughing as much as you did Takasugi. Yes. Um because he's his isn't as advanced. Mm -hmm. However, within within the within that particular raid, um that is that is when a lot of that is when a lot of things come to a head. Both both um ca both Katsura cutting t cutting ties with cutting ties with some of the other radical parts of parts of the clan the fight the fighting getting much much worse to the point where Kyoto does end up in flames um Kenshin and Tomoe um fleeing out fleeing outside of Kyoto to I believe it was Otsu yes to... Otsu was where the the new uh their place was mm-hmm a safe house that Kasura had had arranged, where they were, they would go, th they would go under the guise of being married. Mm -hmm. And in the in the after in the aftermath of it, because of, because of the infighting with the rat with the radical faction of the clan, the con the more conservative side of things, the ones the ones that wanted to. Still, still wanted reform, but wanted to do so through more political means instead instead of outright revolution. Started to gain a much larger foothold. Mm -hmm. To the point where they were ha to the point where they were having, um, quite a quite a few patriots commit seppuku as an act of good faith. You can t you can tell the finger quotes in my voice when I say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And th that that is how the trust part of part of this OVA series ends, which leads us into the betrayal arc, which um the Im the amount of combat in the betrayal arc is not nearly as much as as in the trust arc. It's more of a case of it, for lack of a better term, quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. The there's less fights, but the ones they have, who oh boy. I Not to mention a lot of this second art, uh, second um, the second half is is setting up the emotional payoffs of everything from the first arc and what's required for the fights in the second arc. Yeah, yeah basically, the trust arc is about showing. How Kenjin starts being an emotionless, ruthless killing machine mm -hmm. with no, with the possibility of him never gaining any semblance of humanity. 
the betrayal arc is showing that even a man that is that far gone could possibly still be brought back uh, under the right circumstances, but it comes at a cost. Because very early on, he st he starts to re he starts to op he starts to slowly open up a bit more, especially since one he's. He's he is certainly playing the playing the role of a of a husband, and then further on in a farmer, as well as as well as um being a supposed apothecary. Mm -hmm. And Basically, the clan sends up a whole bunch of medicaid medicines that he sells in the town to be able to afford, be able to keep a living. Well, not not just to keep not just to keep a living, but also to keep to keep any suspicion off of him. Yep. And there there is a, a lot of the times when when Tomo when Tomoe has a conversation with him, it's it is all about tr a lot of it is try a lot of it is trying to. Get him, get him to see a path beyond the expendable way he saw himself. He basically just chips away at his outer shell until near the end when she finally finds an opening. Which, but in the process of doing so, kind of breaks her own armor. Yeah, and it's through that 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 is revealed that she was the fiance of um of the of the man who put that wound on him, as well as the fact that he even though he even though he was not that the idea of him being a bodyguard was seen was seen by everyone else as him being completely out of his league, but he did it anyway to try and impress Tomoe. Because she kind of gave him the impression that she wanted a strong man to protect her. Or at least that was the implication everybody else said that she gave off, too. She, from what we see in the OVA, that's not actually the case. Mm -hmm. Like, she never really uh, gave him the impression that, you know, she needed to have someone strong to protect her. Um, everybody else was saying it. He... Uh, you know, Kiyosato believed it himself, um, and she was, ironically, too reserved to tell Kiyosato not to go, which has re resulted in Kiyosato's death at Kenshin's hand. And when which that did that happen, it almost broke it her. No, it did yeah, break her. It, it, did. it did break her because she, she couldn't felt responsible. Yeah, she couldn't taste the sake anymore, and because she couldn't taste it, she just drank it until she couldn't drink anymore, which is why she was so drunk when she first met Kenshin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and again, it's it, this whole thing about sake and no taste of sake when things are bad um, it has to do with the people's mental states. You actually see a, a payoffs of this all throughout the time after Kenshin meets Tomoe, like even back in the first arc, the trust arc. Um, he starts saying things like, oh, that sake tastes good again. And it, it's a throwaway line almost. You almost don't catch it if you haven't been paying attention. Mm -hmm. But once you catch it, you see it's everywhere. And not just in the fact that people lose the taste, but then that but with, the, but with Tomoe and Kenshin, how they actually get it back. And it also becomes some of the best tasting sake ever when they're drinking it with each other. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, I'd I'd say the the other um, this this ends up really this ends up really coming to a head when for some for some reason Tomoe's little brother manages to manages to find her. No, it's not uh, like he manages to find her. He uh, also wanting revenge for his future for his what could have been his brother in law joins one of the other clans. Who are he tracking him, tracking Kenshin no, he, down? He didn't he, join he, one of the other clans. He joined the Shogunate. He, oh, he joined, joined the Shogunate. That's he joined what I meant. specifically the Yaminobu, mm -hmm. which is the Shogunate Onmitsu group that was uh, 
uh, the other group of assassins meant to kill the Ishin Shishi and other key members of of, of the Patriots during the Bakumatsu. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he was ta- he he had been part of a group that were sent to kill Kenshin, and they had tracked him down, and they used the little brother to basically goad Tomoe, who at one point had also declared revenge back in the day, to goad her into following through on that claim on that threat, even though now she no longer wants to. Well, and even then, she, it's not like she's going to betray him. Uh, she's going to try and protect him, um, because she was originally a spy for the Shogunate, but because of the way that her and Kenshin lived together for uh, ov- over a year, over a year, um, the she saw him be coming out of this shell of being a soulless killer to a man. And not just, and, and he he evolved as as a person. His kills no longer were separate from him, but he also didn't quite know how to process them at all. So there was still a bit of that schism. Mm-hmm. Um, and w- something that had been lampshaded all the way in the ep- the first episode or the second episode. Uh, she's been writing in a diary ever since we've seen her. Ever since we've seen her. Um, with Kenshin. Mm-hmm. And in this arc, when she goes off to, to protect him, uh, she's writing... She, we find out that she's been writing nothing but her feelings. You know, she she knows that he's the guy who murdered her fiancé. She knows what he does for the Ishin Shishi. Initially, she wanted to bring him down. Um, and because of all that, she she starts very cautiously pushing away the emotions she has until she realizes, yeah, I love this man. And is it right right for me to love him? He killed my previous lover. He killed someone else I loved. But I can't help it. And I'm going to make sure that, unlike last time, my feelings are known. Whether they're written here or, as is the case with the penultimate scene in the show, uh, she gives everything to him Mm -hmm. i think it was the first time for both of them pretty sure yeah but uh the the other thing that we see in this um in this whole build-up with them in the in the country as this husband and wife in in hiding um at first it's just an act they don't really act like husband and wife just kind of like two people living in the same house getting along. Mm -hmm. And it does develop closer and closer uh, to the point where another, again, another Chekhov's gun, her carrying around a tanto with her, a tanto knife, um, as a form of protection against all the rambunctious individuals, including the assassins she was around. Um, She eventually leaves it at home one time when they go to sell medicine at the village. And Kenjin notices. Kenjin can't help but notice. He is a warrior. Mm-hmm. Um, and her response... I'm going to butcher it, aren't I? Her response was, um, I don't need it because I'm not around anybody dangerous. You know. I think I think, which, I think the way she put it more specifically is that there's, there's, no, there's no need for an apothecary's wife to have one. Yes. Yeah. An apothecary's wife doesn't need a, doesn't need a weapon. Mm-hmm. But what you implied is pretty much probably what Kenshin read between the lines. Yes, um, that there's that that even Kenshin is no longer dangerous to her, or she doesn't see him as dangerous. Mm-hmm. And it's on that same trip home where she starts getting tired, kind of falls down into the the uh, roadway. He comes back, holds out his hand, and tells her. I will protect my wife. Mm-hmm. So just as she's been growing to love him, he he grew to love her. Yeah. Which the point that they want to get married for real. Yeah. Which makes the re- the reveal of something strange with Izumi 
Um, you've, it's been building up. You've been kind of getting an itchy feeling around him every so often, especially when uh, Tomoe says at one point, I don't like how I don't like being around that man. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> the reveal of the of the traitor is, of course, Izumi. He's the one who convinces Tomoe. Izuka. Or Izuka, yes. Excuse me. Izuka. He's the one who convinces Tomoe uh, that she needs to go talk to the Yaminobu. Uh, also because Anishi is there and Anishi wants to see her. Um, and then after she's finished writing in her book, after, they've, after her and Kenshin have spent their real first night as man and wife, she gets up early in the morning, finishes the last passages in her book, and leaves before he wakes up. Which Izuka... Izuka knows how to use such things to his advantage. Especially since he is as close to Kenshin as he is, he knows exactly how to manipulate him to do what he wants. Yeah. He, um... Especially since we've been seeing Izuka saying things like, He's getting weaker. He's getting soft. And at first, the way he says them, you almost think that uh, he thinks it's a bad thing. But as it's coming closer to Izuka's reveal as a bad guy, he's almost happy about it. And you're like, uh, you swiney, sick motherfucker. <laughs> it doesn't help that he has facial tr- facial features much like a rat. Which I think that's what I think that's exactly what they were going for. Oh, I know. But I'm just just saying, uh, he, uh, he, he, he does look way too much like a rat that you start really getting that, that, uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. I could, I could certainly, I could certainly see that. And of course, of course, of course, the one, of course, um, when he when he realized he got he got followed, one of the uh, one of the, that person gets some um, clawed. The claw, not the claw, the claw. The claw. Oh, yes, ah, the yes, claw. the claw. <laughs> <laughs> but after after the, after that. You have you have Ken- you have Kenshin trying to go at trying to go after, and I'd like to point something out. When we did when we did our watch through of this, there were two per- there were two particular kisses of death that Zan had ranted about more than once. <laughs> One of them was the innkeeper who who compared Tomoe to an iris. That is pretty, even in the rain of blood, and I was like. Woman, why the fuck would you curse him that way? Yeah, like he went off on that shit, man. It's like you throw salt at the bitch. Dispel the evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, I monks sometimes have to pull double duty as priests, so I could probably bless the salt. <laughs> but to be fair, Zan wasn't wrong either. <laughs> the other, th- the other thing is the. Is the le- is the leaving to talk to the bad guys? Ah! <laughs> Flags! Oh! Flags everywhere! I'm genre savvy. I can't help it. I- I'm not. Uh, just be clear, folks. I'm not laughing at Zan. I'm laughing with him because I get it. It was so fucking obvious. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm genre savvy too. And I'm like, oh, you're not even trying to be subtle, are you, series? It, it, if I if I wanted to go for the hat trick and I'm gonna <laughs> fucking the night before and writing her farewell in a diary. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. your hat trick. He's not wrong. Mm-hmm. <sighs> but woman set herself up to be a nice deadly red red spider lotus in the middle of the fucking forest. Which, to be fair, we all knew it was coming, and like I said, this is why, when doing these sort of prequels, the journey is important. 
of course. Because to be fair, we all knew she was going to have to die. Because otherwise, the, the, the series afterwards wouldn't make any fucking sense. Mm -hmm. Not only that, we knew she had to die in order for Kenshin to truly understand why what he was doing was fucking terrible. And that it brought nothing but unhappiness to the people he cared about. But when he when he does go, when he does you are Cyloning again. You're Cyloning again, motherfucker. Ooh. So moving right along, even though he's he is pursuing Tomoe as, as he as he was asked, the fact that Izuka told the fact that Izuka told him to told him one she's the traitor, which caused his wound to reopen. And two, that his orders were to go, to pursue her and kill her. He Let, is. Let's, he, go ahead. I'd like to note that his wound reopening wasn't just a reopening; it bled more than when he had gotten it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like soaking the uh, scarf of hers that he had and just dripping from his face. And the. And ha hammering the point home was the whole read her diary, which ha which had the passage of how her fiance was ass was assassinated. However, this is where I gotta call bullshit because had he just kept reading and read all the way through, he would have realized he would have easily just gone, "Well, wait, she's pretty much forgiven me. What the fuck is he on about?" Yes, can... but let's. To be, to... Uh, being fair, he was already broken at that point. It wouldn't have taken much to convince him that she was who she was that that Izuka was on the up and up. Mm -hmm. No, Iz Izuka did it masterfully. He says, "I know who the the spy is. It's her." That already right there fucked Kenshin up so much that this scar of malediction, this curse, because that's what it is, opens up the worst it's ever been. He's holding her scarf that smells like her. You know, doesn't smell like blood, and it shouldn't smell like blood, as he always continued to say. Um, at the same time, Izuka has just said, yeah, she's the one who's been betraying us. She's the one who almost got you killed. And her, her fiancé was a guy you killed. You don't believe me? Go read her diary. At that point, Kenshin is looking for an out. But he opens the first page, because what do you do with any book, with any diary? You open the first fucking page. And what he sees on the first page confirms what he's told. He's At that point, his mind has snapped. And this is, and because of that, he is, he is walking the same path she did, basically on autopilot. Yeah, yeah. he's... He's got the classic um, flat eyes effect that you see in a lot of anime when people are uh, unconscious, soulless, or otherwise Go. empty, hollow. Yeah. That and that I think is the one we're looking for here. He is just he is just gone at this point. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as he goes on, and we'll get into what happens with that as he goes on, you can tell he's fighting himself. He is battling himself. He's like, everything seems right that she's the traitor. She's she's out for revenge. But I can't ignore the fact that what we just happened with us that the that that love was real. How could she be the traitor if she's if she truly loved me? And you know how we've talked we talked about how early on there were several Chekhov's guns being set off. Mm -hmm. This is where you real. This is where a lot of those. Um, Chekhov's guns start firing. One of them being what Katsura warned warned about. The demon inside consuming. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we could probably call this a Chekhov's armory or a Chekhov's volley. Yeah. Because it's, it's an entire firing squad, Monk. Yeah. <laughs> and Kenshin <laughs> takes the brunt. Oh, yeah. Because he's feeling all the guilt. Like, he's like, she did this because of me, but she loved me. What she, he could, he just, how could any one man process all of the different emotions going through Kenshin's head at that very moment? Mm -hmm. I don't think you could. You'd have to compartmentalize. It's the only way you'd survive, which is why he, uh, 
he he did so poorly all the way up to the final fight. <laughs> yeah, about that. Let's let's get to cuz this band literally goes through hell. So the this entire ending sequence is a series of amazing sakuga moments, even if they're small, even if they're brief. Um Kenshin is as we said on autopilot. The man's empty. Um, and so the people, the particular uh, members of the Yaminobu start attacking him. Uh, when each of them inevitably fails to kill him, even though he's on autopilot, he's not fighting to his best, he's taking injuries, he still manages to kill them. Um, or at least wound them extremely severely before every fucking one of them goes and grabs a goddamn bomb. <laughs> Motherfuckers, you do not need to learn your tricks from. Never mind, I'm not going to finish that sentence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably a good idea, but yeah, these fuckers, when they realize they can't beat his ass, they just go kamikaze on him. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And, like, the first explosion blows out one of his eardrums. You can see the blood coming out of his ear. Um, also fucks up his entire left side. And even then, he uh, still keeps going. Like, he's, like... We talked We talked about him being, like, a machine um, earlier on. And this is a bit more literal. Well, this is also the machine partially broke down. Mm -hmm. um, ice cream machine's only making vanilla soft serve right now, guys. The chocolate's not active. <laughs> but, uh... The uh, the se the second set, it's two of them, two that work together. He gets fucked. The claw guy manages to stab his shoulder and a few other places. Axe guy throws him around and nearly chops his head off a couple times. Um, but he still gets them too. And so Axe guy pulls the next explosive, which by the time Kenshin gets to the final member and leader of the Yaminobu, um. He's just like, you're going to be easy prey. And they're fighting, and they're, they're, they're currently, you know, the Yaminobu leader is killing Kenshin, almost literally. Inishi is watching from the trees, and Tomoe, after she, she arrived and was talking to the leader of the Yaminobu, uh, she was manipulated into her own guilt trap. You loved Kiyosato. How can you love this assassin? You're betraying Kiyosato's memory. You're betraying your your family. You're betraying the shogunate. And she's stuck in this grief loop. Until a very ghostly and likely hallucinating from the cold in her guilt um, image of a dead Kiyosato holding a, a persimmon blossom drops it on the floor of the little shrine she's in and she kind of sees it as a you have one chances at absolution moment mm -hmm. which leads to kenshin fulfilling his contract he was told to go kill her y'all remember that right mm -hmm. <sighs> He's still fighting the leader of the Yaminobu. He has one chance to kill this guy, even though it'll result in him taking a fatal hit as well. That's, that's the trade-off he's seeing. And that's what he goes to do. And Tomoe steps in the way to take the uh, Tanto that she had always had with her that the leader of the Yaminobu had confiscated from her, that he was going to use to kill Kenjin. Mm -hmm. Um... And at the same time, Kenshin's sword cuts through her body and the leader of the Yaminobu. And Kenshin fucking flips. Oh my god. Oh, Definitely the most heart-wrenching scene of the entire fucking movie. And Tomoe's last gift is making a second cut on Kenshin's cheek. That was another flag I bitched about. Why the fuck would you deepen his curse? You love him. Don't do that. I think the in I think the intent was to was to have was to cancel it out. 
even though that's not what it did. <laughs> no, but th- again, she was already dying. I don't think she was in the proper mental state to think about that being fair here. Um, she- I, I hesitate to agree there because she's very calm when doing it. And Kenshin doesn't make the effort to avoid it. And in fact, almost seems to have resigned himself to it. He's accepting her curse as a part of his guilt. No, well, that's probably true. But he's he... probably accepted. You know, that's that that moment of I know what I've done. Do what you must. But instead of killing him, like she probably like he probably expected her to, that was her revenge. I don't even think it was meant as revenge from her. The way I see it, she she was seeking to always have him remember her. Of course, that in its in and of itself is a curse. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's Curse just or one, not, it makes sense. It's just one that stu- that stopped the that stopped the wound from bleeding the way it had the way it had been for, throughout the, throughout the entire OVA. And at the end of at the end of this, the person who was persona non grata, who had basically disappeared, finally shows up in the form of Katsura. And he says he discovered the real Bai and had a new assassin take him out. That assassin being Shishio Makoto. Mm-hmm. And told Kenshin that he needed his that he needed Kenshin's help. Because the war was going to kick into full gear. And Kenshin looked at him and said, on one condition. And that condition was that after the war is over, everything is said and done, Kenshin leaves and is never asked to be an assassin again because he cannot honor Tomoe and her life if he is a swordsman taking lives. Mm-hmm. Which, he di- which he did, and you have a, you have a bit of a... You have a and all the, all the while carrying Tomoe's scarf... And with, including one, including one moment where Okita try uh, finally finds him, tries to tries to pick a fight with him is clearly outmatched, and is only bailed out because Sato shows up. A fight which um we never Saito. see. Saito. Yeah, Saito shows up. We never see the conclusion of of that particular fight, largely because that largely because there's not a need to. A lot of what a lot of what's seen is essentially a montage of the many battles, as well as the death of Takasugi, who managed to who at the very least managed to managed to live long enough to see the to see the war. Though he unfortunately did not live to see the rest of the restoration, which is what he truly wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, Takasugi even wrote a uh, a poem on his deathbed. Only half of it, though. He didn't manage to to finish the other half. That half being, um, I made our little place in the world a bit more interesting. Or something along those lines. Yeah. And the final the final coda is Se- is Seichiro seeing a seeing a grave with Tomoe's scarf and him remembering his remembering his words to to the to a boy named Shinta because <laughs> uh, Hiko Seijiro the uh, the 13th continues to return to that graveyard mm-hmm. interestingly enough and state and st- that's it. and those same words you hear you hear as a bit of you hear as a bit of a coda that the name Shinta is a child's name, too soft for a swordsman. From here on, you are Kenshin. And with now that we've covered what the events that transpired, and there's a lot that we skipped over because there's a lot of little details in these four OVAs. But I think there's a, there's a few things that I think we should cover. One... I was a bit I was a bit um hesitant 
regarding whether or not we'd go with the dub or the sub for this because early 2000s dubs some are a bit of the wild west some of them have aged fairly well and some of them have aged a little bit less so yeah so when you're doing an old school dub it's a crapshoot luckily for us this ended up being a winner mm -hmm. i'd say i mean it's aged like it definitely shows its age it's got some stiffness here and there but for this movie, I think that worked in its favor, and it. But it was because it was never that bad. It was never that stiff. It's that. It's that era of um. It's that era of uh, of anime where they were still saying Saki instead of Sake. And they call <laughs> they called her instead of calling her Tomoe, they kept calling her Tomo. Yeah, yeah. and I am tr I am trying to. F I was trying to find the um, dub cast, and I and I did not have and I did not have any luck on that front. Jay well, Shannon try very hard. Jay, Sh <laughs> Jay Shannon Weaver for trust and betrayal. Yeah, not the original voice of Kenshin from the series, which was Richard Cancino, but I will say I think they got a good choice for it. He sounded similar enough to Cancino. But because it was a more serious uh, move, uh, OVA, him having a more serious-sounding version of that voice worked out really good. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. Now I, f I did find the, I did find the ca the cast. Um, Catherine Catmull as um, as Shinta sounded a bit off, but I can't but I can't really bl I can't really blame her for that. Yep. Um, Rebecca, I think Rebecca Davis did a ver did a very good job with what she had as um, Tomoe. Yeah, very serious, very. I wouldn't say strong, but just a little rough, mm -hmm. all things considered. Yeah. The what I do what I, um what I do find kind of amusing is. As as is two things. One, a lot of the a lot of the dub cast is case is names that um. A, I'd say a lot. I'd say a lot of people, even people who got started with anime around that time, aren't going to be familiar with. Now I don't. I'm, I'm looking at a lot of these names. I don't recognize any of them. And, and I'm, I'm and I've made it known. I'm pretty well versed in anime and, and dub voice actors. I've not heard of any of these guys. Yeah. Now, when, of course, when it comes to the Japanese voice acting, we've got plenty of names we we um we are familiar with, including including one of your favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I take that back. I did find one. Okita. I recognize the dub voice. Actually, no, wait. Oh, never mind. That That's... was only in the original anime, not in. The, and it's still Shannon Weaver for the for the OVA. Got. Yep. Yep. Jay Jay Shannon Weaver talked to himself when Okita and uh. And Kenshin were facing off. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, at least that's, you know, not as bad as... It's not a full Scott McNeil <laughs> moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although, the, looking at... Now, we're looking specifically at the... Or you're looking specifically at the, at the Trust and Betrayal cast, which is unknown compared to the main anime cast, almost. Mm -hmm. um, because names... <laughs> Names that you'll see in the main anime cast. Um, oh yeah, I forgot about the whole pseudonym thing. That was a thing. Well, I mean, I don't think the pseudonyms are are kept as much anymore. No, they're not. But back in the but back in the day, that was a that was a frequent thing. I think. Um, I think there's I think there's been a handful of voice actors who have talked about how in the early days they had to they had to operate under a pseudonym because of some I mean, crediting issue. I, I mean David Lucas reasons. being the biggest one. Everybody knows Steve's good friend David Lucas. He even has a <laughs> blog post writing about his friend David Lucas taking parts and they sound remarkably alike, but it's not Steve. <laughs> For international copyright reasons, it is not Steve. It's Steve now though they 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 corrected that. Yeah. But n names you'll see from I'm going to use specifically both Bang Zoom and Sony. Um, Saito. 
Kirk Thornton or Dan Warren? Uh, Kaoru, Delphi, uh, Dorothy Elias Fawn or Rebecca Forstott? Um, Sonosuke, Lex Lang or Derek Stephen Prince? Uh, Yahiko, Wendy Lee or Brienne Sidal? Mm-hmm. And of course, Kedjin, we already mentioned, is Richard Cancino. Yeah. Now, as far as why, the, even though this is a Roroni Kenshin story, as far as why it is called Trust and Betrayal, or, re- or rather called um, Samurai X, the theory, I've never gotten confirmation about this, but the theory that I always had is, at the time, the dubbing, of, the dubbing and distribution of Roroni Kenshin, the proper anime, was handled by Media Blasters. ADV only had the OVAs and the film. And I get the f- I get the feeling that they that um they didn't want to start anything, so they didn't u- so they didn't use the na- so they didn't use the Roroni Kenshin name. Because mm-hmm. it was all called Roroni Kenshin in Japan. Oh, there is also the possibility of one getting released before the other. At least at least in the states. I don't I don't recall the US release dates, but I could see that as a possibility. Um let me check. Cause the US release date of the original anime series would have been uh ninety six mm-hmm. on Cartoon Network, I think. Or maybe later. Um no, it would have been later on Cartoon Network, but it was early two thousands uh, on when it was on the Toonami block, but it had already been making the rounds on the DVD circuit for a few years by then. Yeah, whereas um, the OVA Trust and Betrayal uh, was released in North America. I just in, checked. Yeah, August twenty two two thousand twenty uh, was when Trust re- released, and November fourteenth later that year was when Betrayal re- released um, with. With the Cartoon Network run of the uh, of the actual show, uh, that was 2003. Mm-hmm. And 2003 was when the director's cut came out. And there's not there's not too many there's not too many differences between the between the direct between the director's cut and the original. Mm-hmm. The main th- the main thing that changes is oh, is um it combines all four OVA episodes into one movie. Which I'm not. I wouldn't recommend going through in one sitting, if I'm being if I'm being completely honest. Nah. It, 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 obviously, if it, depending on how they did it, like if it's a movie, they probably also cut stuff out because that's that's a tricky thing you got to be careful of. No, they they actually didn't. Well, surprising. The main the main thing that changed is placement of music. There were certain scene there were certain scenes in the OVA version. Where the, where um mu- where certain musical stings are used that were not used at all in the director's cut. So it's kind of similar to what they did with Gundam Wing Endless Waltz, where the movie version had some music changes from the OVA version. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that one thing that I did find ca- I did find kind of amusing is the um an- is the animation studios. I believe um. I believe the TV anime was handled by Piero, although I could be wrong on that. But the but the anim, but the OVAs were handled by Studio Dean. Mm-hmm. So so that's two so that's two that's two um stal, that's two stalwarts of my of my younger anime days that Studio Dean <laughs> is associated with. Uh, the no the anim the anime was Studio Gallop and then the last half was Studio Dean as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, I stand corrected. I also I also noticed that it, that JC staff was a helper studio, which for an for something like this is definitely where they sh- where they should be. They should not be anywhere near in any action heavy series. Yes, I'm still salty about season two of One Punch Man. We will not forgive. We will not forget. And no, we are not anonymous. <laughs> and I'm all, and I'm equally oh, salty. Oh, that's a and there, fucking. I have a whole I have a whole volume in the Book of Grudges dedicated to the Sukihime anime. 
And uh, Zan is probably staring at me. I am <laughs> I am I am staring daggers not at you, but at uh at the Nasu verse. And especially at Tsukihime. Look, I uh, love I love the Tsukihime gra- graphic novel, but or not, not graphic novel, visual novel. What the fuck am I saying? But JC staff had no business doing that. Yeah. Now, that be I should now I I know I said that that means that Studio Dean is tangentially related to two um, land landmarks for me as an anime fan. One might ask what the other one is. They're responsible for the or- for the orphan remake, which we'll get to one of these days. <laughs> Just not anytime soon. Someday down the line. Mm-hmm. But I'd say if if there's one, if there's one thing that re- that really really stands out to the point where I implore anyone who likes music from anime to go, to go give a few go give a listen to, it's the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I still have the soundtrack CD that was composed by Taku Iwasaki, and while while there's nothing that you would consider a banger, there are plenty of musical stings that have been stuck in my head for years. Especially all of the flute work. To, to give you an idea of how good this uh, Iwasaki's music is, uh, I've re- back in my day, I've reviewed a few anime he's done work for. Most notably, Noragami Aragoto. Mm-hmm. A series that I gave one of my few diamond seals to. Mm-hmm. Now... When it, when it now um, with all, with all of that with all of that said, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think if aside from Rebecca da- Rebecca not Rebecca Davis but um, Catherine Catmull, if there were and if there were any um, any bits of voice acting that didn't quite hold up, and I can't I can't really think of any. That, that like if as long as you're looking as long as you're considering it of the the dubbing of the time. No, nothing um, seems outright bad. Like uh, Inishi. I don't think Brian Gaston could get him sounding young enough. It sounded like an older person trying to sound younger. Yeah, that was something they hadn't quite figured out during that time. Was like because like some people could just naturally do it, but unless you could do it naturally, it just wasn't going to work. Mm-hmm. A lot of ch- child characters had that problem with dubbing back in the day. I'm just sad that we didn't get to see hear Katsura as Tomokazu Seki. I love Tomokazu Seki. You should all love Tomokazu Seki because get her. And G Gundam. <laughs> and Also, oh wait, I think I know which, which which Seiyu you were talking about when you were mentioning with someone I even I'd recognize. Cause I see the Seiyu cast and there's a name that jumps out at me pretty hard. Which one? One you probably wouldn't think of right away. Riki Akuyama. Oh no, that's exactly who I was thinking. Actually, <laughs> um, okay. Man. For for anyone who, for anyone who doesn't get it, uh, Riki Akuyama, uh, go watch Shokugeki no Soma. Soma's dad. Mm-hmm. Oh no 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 no! There's another. Uh, I've we've seen his live action work before. Oh yeah, he's great. <laughs> I love Riki Akuyama. Mm-hmm. He, he's got he's got some common rider work under his belt, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't recognize that name, uh, I've got two words for you: Rida time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't bring up Joe the Hayes. <laughs> yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up Yakuza's Taiga Saejima. Mm-hmm. Oh God! But... Wait, on oh, him? Is, is, that's what I'm thinking. Is oh fuck y- y- the the guy that in that uh. I'll let you look him up later. But <laughs> oh, never mind, never mind. It's not who I thought it was, but still, oh, I do recognize that face. Yeah, or you know, Riki Maru in Tenchu Four, or you know, oh. and he, yes, like we pointed out, he's done a bunch of uh, of common writer stuff. He's um, also he's also done a he's also done a fair bit of Metal Hero stuff. 
True. Man gets around, let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. I I love Rikio Koyama. He's so good. Um He's the Japanese Frank West in Project Cross Zone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And of course, to anyone who is a Fate fan, fan since we just mentioned the Nasuverse earlier, Kiritsugu Emiya, Shiro Emiya's adoptive father. Mm -hmm. oh, he does I'll a do, lot I'll of dad do, roles. Hell, I'll, I'll do something a little more uh, modern. Uh, any Demon Slayer fans out there? Because fuckers run Goku. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That be that being said. That being said, now my heart hurts. <laughs> yeah, thanks, they, they, thank you, Shades. I needed those feels. That was completely <laughs> justified. Um, I know, I know, I know. You know how you know how I've um I've ta I've talked about certain certain anime um breaking my immersion by using obvious CG. We have a, we have a different spin on that, but it doesn't break my immersion as much, and that is using live action footage in conju in conjunction with animated footage. Yeah, the only one time they use it here is for certain establishing shots, like when they're walking down, walking by the river, or walking by the ocean, and you can see the ocean is clearly live action crashing up against the animated the anim the hand drawn wave or hand drawn shore it actually creates a nice little artistic touch to it i'd say another i'd say another thing that that this is used for is fireplaces oh yeah monk and, go ahead just one last thing about rikia Koy koyama um he's a sid <laughs> he's the japanese voice of sid for 14 <laughs> oh god for a realm reborn he was he was there for a realm reborn which means in the japanese side of things he's there all the way till endwalker now but uh i, I just had to now he's a sid as well yep. but yeah the the juxtaposition of the two of the live shots with the with the animated action um was done only only very sporadically and for as shade said very specific shots that needed a very specific feel and it cer it certainly makes sense for a l for a lot of them because well when you did when you dig deep into animation you end up learning one very crucial thing there's a lot of shortcuts people take especially during that time like i I've, I've bitched to hell and back about 90s anime when it comes to still still shots where in an, an action scenes where basically you just see a uh, someone that doesn't attack and the other person just jumps out of the way or gets thrown out and you just see a still shot of them flying. Mm -hmm. It's so annoying. Or and then let's... trigger and then trigger weaponized that and kill a kill. Or let's br let's bring up one of one of my favorite pet peeves of of 90s anime. Cell reuse. And oh, would, you, yeah. would you like to take a guess as to whom as to who my biggest whipping boy or in this case whipping girl is when it comes to cell reuse. You're giving it away. <laughs> as much as as much as I enjoy it, the the patient zero of cell reuse for me is um Sailor Moon. Yep. <laughs> I, I was about oh, to start what? singing Moonlight Densets. Yeah, all right. I'm glad. You oh, did. one of the many many reasons I still hold a gr I I I have very my book of grudges is very short compared to the monks. Now it's very short in general. The original Sailor Moon anime is in my book of grudges. Are we just talking and, about know, in people general? Who have, it, there are so many problems, so many things I just cannot stand about the original Sailor Moon. Hell, back when I back in the very old days of my reviews, I got in an argument with a Sailor Moon fangirl in a review about this, and I still stand by everything I said in that video. For See, still shots, dash lines, repetitive, episodic storylines. I mean, it it helps that they were actually following the repetitive, episodic storylines of the manga. <laughs> no, no, like it was worse than the manga because my god, 
I could literally break down, like take away maybe the the be- the, op- the 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 beginning episodes and the final couple of episodes, and I could break down every single episode of Sailor of the original Sailor Moon anime into a very simple formula that is reused every single fucking time. I mean, it's a shoujo anime. I don't know what you expect. Mm-hmm. I've seen shoujo anime that didn't pull that shit. Oh come on! You were supposed to take the joke further, Shades. Nip, nip, not on this case. Look, but uh, to get back on the rails, I'll sim- I'll simply I'll simply end that with saying, for as for as embarrassing as some of the gaffes were with its t- with its early TV run, I would re- I would rather watch Crystal than read Ross the original. And and of course, the Crystal BDs corrected a lot of those issues. Mm-hmm. So I mean, just get those. There you go. But I can un- I can completely understand using live action footage for wa- for waves or for a fireplace because I could easily see those being a royal pain in the ass to draw frame by frame. Fire is a fucking nightmare to draw frame by frame. Yeah, and bear in mind folks, this was this was this was on the early 2000s. CG anime had only just Barely. And actually, I think this came out even before then. Yeah, DigiPaint that, wasn't really being used at this point. No. Yeah, DigiPaint wasn't even being used at this point. So to so yeah, they had to do everything hand drawn. Not an easy thing to do. And again, you can the fact that they could use this to make create an artistic touch. Why not take the shortcut? <laughs> well, I, I'm pretty sure though that um, the animation for the OVA is on seconds. Um. It's it's not firsts. The keyframes are not on firsts. But no, it's definitely... the only the only time you're gonna see animation on ones is with is with those is with a lot of um the better Disney animations or, or um, um for, or the or the or the kind of animated films that you tend to see get released by G Kids in the states or um Rasera 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 Akira. Akira was animated on ones at 24 FPS, no less, mm-hmm. which is why it looked so goddamn smooth and was a fucking budget black hole for the time. And I think I think we need to clarify what we mean by animating on ones versus animating on twos. What it what it means is the number of unique drawings per frame. Instead of tweens, mm-hmm. which is where you just go between two keyframes. Mm-hmm. Um, animating on ones means every frame is a keyframe, technically, at that point. Mm-hmm. It means every frame is a unique drawing, which is what a keyframe is usually referred to. Animating on twos means every other frame is a keyframe. Mm-hmm. And th- I'd say, I'd say, um, I'd say if the I'd, the reason why I say that that um watching watching the full on director's cut in one in one sitting is something I don't advise is because of the is because of the fact that combining the t- combining the two there's not really a break point. Yeah, you don't get the the catharsis like you do between the OVA episodes. And you would think you would you would think that you think that it'd be easy you think that it'd be easy since it amounts to about two about two hours in total, but t- but time can feel differently depending on, depending on what you're watching, and two hours of a a, ve- a very a very slow burn type of show is something that not everybody's going to be able to do. Even Very with true. what we did, even even though we even though we went through all four OVAs in one sitting, um, it's not like we weren't taking breaks in between. Not yeah, only we that, take... we... sorry, uh, uh, we would we would not only just take a break, we would deli- we would deliberate over what we'd just seen, mm-hmm. you know, mull things over just a little bit, chew through what we've experienced. Yeah, take, take that time to savor each episode, so that we could. You know, have that process and digest it so that when we're when the next one starts, we're ready for it. Yeah, when we go, when we cover things for the parliament, we te- we tend to stagger it because if we if we were to marathon something in one go, um, 
there would be a whole lot of exhaustion. Plus, um, while I, while while some of us may be natural night owls, that's not something I wish on everyone. And of course, there's some of us who sacrifice our well-being to play Elden Ring. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be talking from experience or anything. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. Too subtle. Not at all, Mr. Not at all, Mr. 92 hours split between essentially three weekends. However, with all of with all of that with before we get into our final deliberations, there is one thing I need to I need to cover that's been a bit of an elephant in the room th throughout this. And um this is where I'm this is where I'm going to get a little bit heated. Okay. Uh-oh. You'll recall early on I had I had said that this is the OVA series that a lot that it se it seems that a lot of the official release end of the equation doesn't want us to see. You're not the only one heated now, monk. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're all angry now. Yeah. I'm, um Shades, you got the soapbox button? Oh, absolutely, my friend. Let me go ahead and hit that for you right here. Thank you. I usually don't call for the soapbox button unless it's absolutely fucking necessary. Plus, we have to rebrand it as Monk's Pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you'll if you'll allow me to get if you'll allow me to give a bit of a sermon, now, a policy that we a policy a policy that we have had in both the monastery, in Geek Watch, and in the Parliament is we do not condone piracy unless absolutely necessary. Or, as Racevic put it, I don't condone piracy, but I also don't condone giving people no choice. Cause yeah, or you could take the, the, the RVT official policy. We here at RVT Entertainment do not condone the act of piracy unless you really, 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 really have no other choice. And this is a policy that's gotten us on the bad side of certain voice actors who decide to mouth off without understanding the full context. As they're stupid. Including at least including at least one who decided to talk who decided to talk crap about it and then blocked me when I when I talked about particular very good works that aren't on any official sources. Yeah, but I actually double checked that. That was I believe that was Alex Moore. Mm hmm. And uh, as we're getting to the point here. Uh, Trust and Betrayal is one of those things that has no official fucking streaming source, and the DVDs are out of fucking print! Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, here, here's what you, you, you're thinking. Oh, you guys probably just didn't look hard enough. No, 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 no. I use a, I use a website called JustWatch.com. It is the ultimate streaming service meta search. You type in a show, it tells you every single service it is available on. It will tell you where you can go to watch this. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go ahead and double check for everybody right now, just just to make a point. And we should check both names just to further that point. Well, it'll yep. be under. Uh, it'll be under one. Mm -hmm. Roroni Kenshin, Tsuyoku Hen, and Samurai X Trust and Betrayal. Are all co are collected under a single entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Trying to find the damn thing correctly is being a pain in the ass. I'm not even okay. I know I found this before. Because the la the last times that we have checked, and I seriously doubt that has miraculously changed in the span of seven days. It is not on any service. It's not. Nope. On I just checked. Right now, I'm looking. First of all, you have to look under the Ron the the actual Roroni Kenshin entry because it's actually part of the Roroni Kenshin line. Not it's not under Samurai X, mm -hmm. but it's here. Roroni Kenshin Trust and Betrayal OVA. Even under Best Price, zero. It is not available on any service. Period. In fact. I'm going to go one further. I'm going to go to eBay. Oh, eBay. Cuz since it's out of print, that mean that means that trying to trying to get the DVD or even the Blu-ray is going to be difficult. 
Given this series, I think the Blu-ray would be even harder. Roni Kenshin, the complete series, uh, which is just the anime, I'm guessing. 40 to 50 bucks. That's just the Roni Kenshin regular anime. Mm-hmm. Live action movies are even 40 to 50 bucks, depending on who you're buying from. Um, I, I, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's no entry for Trust and Betrayal, I think. I remember, uh, I remember looking around and see, and seeing a three DVD package for all, th- for oh, the, three, for, yeah. For that and reflection, and that was that was closer to a hundred bucks. Actually, there is I can see here a pre-owned Samurai X Trust Betrayal Reflection Collection DVD set with condition good for forty four dollars and ninety nine cents. I almost don't trust that. That's yeah, yeah. seems a little too I, good to be true. I actually just looked on Amazon. Now, you can get a digital copy of it, it looks like, for... Oh, no, that's DVD. But I don't know if it's actually available for about 30 bucks. The only other version that's clearly available is a DVD set, but the pro- for 23 or about 24 bucks. The only problem is it's an import from Germany. Yeah. So... I have only found... Okay, here's here's another one. Uh, Samurai X The Complete Collection 5-Disc OVA 2006. New, new Other is the condition, or like new. Mm-hmm. Um, $75. Seems legit? I am... I'm not going to call this legit. Although the description does says the seller assumes all responsibility for this listing. Yeah, but the, but there's a whole lot of interpretation that can go down with that. Yeah, I'm OVA Blu-ray new slash other one bid five days left for twenty five bucks. I don't believe this. I yeah, don't believe this. That's the thing. Even when trying to get the disc legit, there's a whole lot of sketchiness because whenever you're trying to get something that's out of print, it is very much the wild west. Maybe if you go to a con- if you go to a con and you see it, you might be able to get lucky that way. But that's needle in a haystack shit. Yeah, and all these yeah. ones that I'm seeing that are trust and betrayal entries, I I can't trust them. They are no. very. They're very much, um, it's just too sketchy. Like, the sellers either have, have a, a, a very low amount of scores, even if the score is high, or things of that nature. I can't trust it. This is why eBay is always the last resort for me, because of things like that. Mm-hmm. And it's for that, re- it's for that reason that we would love to... To um sh- to share an of- to share an official release, I would love to put that in the description of this video, but I can't because there because there isn't one and there isn't a re- there isn't a reliable source other than sailing the high seas, which means I am now obligated to press this button. <laughs> Whenever a vo- whenever a voice actor um, laments that laments about people pirating, I'm going to bring this particular. O- I'm going to, as I have in the past, bring up this particular OVA and say, until I can, until this get gets on some streaming service, you're full of shit. I may respect your work, but you're still full of shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did a whole video about this. Uh, a long time ago, which unfortunately I had to take down, but I did a soapbox when Alex Moore made her tweet, basically breaking down her arguments and proving that while she did make some valid points, there were a lot of them that uh, no. Would it be fair to say that her issue was she was um not seeing the forest for the trees? Yeah, like look in this day and age, yes, the piracy argument has lost a good chunk of its weight. 
There, Ooh. it's a lot harder to justify most piracy. However, the th I would never say at this point that piracy is dead, that the need for piracy doesn't exist, because as we are establishing right this very moment, there are still shows. Hell, when I review, I reviewed Persona Four: The Animation. You know, the good one. Mm -hmm. Same exact fucking problem. No streaming service is showing it because, well, obviously, uh, Atlas doesn't want to license that one. They want to license the ones that they currently are working work with, which are so the sucky ones. So, no streaming site is selling them, and the DVDs are worse when it comes to trying to find a decent price for those fucking things. At the time, didn't you say that one on the cheap was over 100 bucks? Yeah, the cheap end. That's the kind of price that's it, that was in those season DVDs back in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. And again, and, and that yeah, you had to pay at least 100 bucks to get both sets to get the full series. Mm -hmm. The uh the while the monastery and RVT Entertainment do not uh condone piracy except you if you really 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 need to. Me being an agent of chaos who is only somewhat uh associated with the monastery says there's a reason piracy came back we had one streaming service and it was nice we didn't need piracy anymore we could pay eight bucks and everybody gets paid now we have like 10 all of them want yeah. eight to ten dollars <laughs> oh oh zan yeah but you know what the argument is now well didn't funimation and crunchyroll just merge so almost all of our enemies in one place <laughs> uh, almost all of our enemies in one place crunchyroll and fun mm. first of all crunchyroll funimation sus uh, second of all, um, are you fucking high? <laughs> Most of our anime? Even a fraction of our anime? Are you 100% insane? There's so much anime that isn't there. No, but it does hold 92% of the market share. I checked. And yes, folks, a soapbox is coming on that. I already have finished the script for it. That being, uh, that being that being said, the 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 big the big issue the big issue is that not is that um a lot is that a lot of people are um so are so focused on trying to get what's coming that th that they neglect trying to trying to ar trying to archive history. The reason and, Retro Crush became a thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Retro Crush Retro Crush should get this. Retro Crush should get this. I'd I'd say I'd if there's anybody who's been the flag bearer of trying of trying to keep classics around, it's Discotech. Cal, they just announced their bre they they got the rights to the Darkstalkers anime. Mm -hmm. they, they also got the right to uh what did they just recently get the rights to? Hold on. I I, I just saw they it. They just made some big announcements. they just put out a series of announcements literally this evening, which Kaishi. Discotech has gotten it uh, to, to upscale Kekaishi and, and uh, release it with the classic dub and new subs. Mm -hmm. I, there we go. I also recall that that they, that um, it took them a lot of work to try and get the masters for Project Echo. Yeah, yeah. they busted their ass for. It. Okay, J just just to catch everyone up to speed, Discotech just announced the 1980s Astro Boy. Fuse Memoirs of the Hunter Girl, Loop on the Third, Prison of the Past, Case Closed, Fist of Blue Sapphire, Galactic Whirlwind, Sasurager, 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 thank you. You're welcome. Powered Armor, Dorvac. Oh yeah, they got a bunch of. I, I just okay. So I've been seeing discotech announcements everywhere amongst my Discord servers, especially in across Discord, because they're getting a bunch of classic mecha anime too. Mm -hmm. They they also got the original Digimon Adventure, nice Monkole Knights, Sergeant Frog, and uh, thank God Cure's not here right now. They also got the rights to Sinfo Gear GX. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thank God Cure's not here. We right love we love you Cure, but uh, we 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 didn't need an entire spiel <laughs> on Sinfo Gear. For the for the record, I don't think I don't think Sinfo Gear will be making any appearances in the Parliament. But, nope, I'm gonna go ahead and put the kibosh on that right fucking now. Sorry, yeah. Cher. But uh, 
Disco, Discotech, Retro Crush, and High Dive. Those are the guys I see trying to make the most um, for archiving purposes, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well, they kind of have to because all the new stuff's going over to Crunchyroll now, so they don't really have much choice. But that means that they're going to be more valuable in the long run. I agree. I'm just saying. Yeah. That be that being said. That being said. I think we've I think we've covered everything that we can feasibly cover. So it's time for the it's time for the deliberation. It is time to dis it, members of the members of the parliament, good brothers and sisters all. It is time to pass judgment upon Samurai X trust and betrayal on whether it is weeb or scrub. All right, good brothers present. We do have a vote from a brother who was unable to make it but did watch this with us. Good brother Matty had to bow out, but he cast his vote as Weeb. In this case, I now ask you, Monk, Weeb or Scrub? Even I, some reviewers had said that it that people should watch um, the Uroni Kenshin anime before stepping into Samurai X. I do not agree with this. While it can certainly ha help. I don't think it's necessary because Samurai X is a classic, um, bittersweet um, samurai kind of story. The kind of the kind of story that you'd see a lot in classical Japan, and it work. And I'd say it works just as well on its own as it does as a prequel to Roroni Kenshin. And in fi in fact, um, in fact, watching it and then watching the then watching the anime might. Co whether you, regardless of which one you watch first, there's going to be a bit of disconnect because of the different art style between the two. The TV anime obviously is trying to be more akin to Watsuki's art style, while um, Samurai X is not. And with all with all of that said, with the fact that you have an extremely atmospheric tragedy. And one that it one that is very much of its time and manages to be above it, as well as the place that it's ha that it's had in the years since. I dub Samurai X Trust and Betrayal Weeb, and thus the monk casts his vote for Weeb. Good brother Shades, what be your decree? Yes, my friend, as the anime connoisseur that I am. I know good anime when I see it, ladies and gentlemen. I have seen the worst and the best that this medium has to offer. And I will certainly not be placing this in the latter half of that category. I do agree with the monk, however, that it does not matter which you watch first, not just because of the difference in tone. Anyone who says that, oh, you have to watch this to get connections from the end, or watch the anime first to kind of figure out the connections, I don't agree with that. Because the connection, the the ties to the anime, to the actual, to the main series, are not so tight that watching the anime will give you any idea. You can watch, you can see characters like Saito and Sh and Shishio and, and Okita, and not have a and not need to know who they are to get what they're doing there. Their place is as relevant as it needs to be here at this fucking moment. But with a tragic and that tone difference. This being a darker, more mature, more tragic story as opposed to the main series, which is a bit more lighthearted and fun with some seriousness sprinkled throughout, creates a disconnect. But one that makes sense once you understand what this leads into. With great animation, which Studio Dean had its had some good moments here and there, though we don't talk about the original Fruits Basket. Sorry guys, that one's not very good in animation-wise. But with great animation, good use of shortcuts, amazing soundtrack, and a tragic story that hooks you in from moment one and does not fucking let go, this series is a classic. I hereby dub Samurai X Trust and Betrayal to be weeb! Brother Shades has cast his decree. Samurai X is weeb. As for myself, these men have spoken all the words I can speak. They've covered all the points I can take. The only thing I can say is 
That Samurai X trust and betrayal is declared as weeb from myself. And thus, for weeb, zero scrub. Samurai X trust and betrayal, be weeb. <laughs> May you sit amongst the pantheon of classic legendary anime. You have earned that, my friend. We just don't talk about the original creator. <laughs> that you is, had uh, to bring that up at the end, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody had to say it! Somebody had to fucking say it! No, we didn't! There was no need to bring up an elephant that bad. <laughs> Look, all I, all, I will, all I will say is that that is that um, that is a very complicated situation and one that ironically is a reflection of... Unintentional pun there. Of, yeah, it was some, say. of some of some of a major theme throughout Roroni Kenshin of forgiveness regarding past sins. <laughs> uh, Bonsai Pop went into far more detail than I feel like doing, so just watch his take on the matter. And as and I know some people might say, but there were three OVAs. What about reflection? We are not going to talk about reflection. We do not acknowledge Reflection. Watsky hated Reflection, and it's argued that he ended up doing more, more the Hokkaido arc because of how much he hated Reflection, much in the same way that that Toriyama set things in motion for Super because of how much he hated Evolution. So if you're going to ask what about Reflection, yeah, what about Reflection? Now, Let, let's put it this way. There's no mirror in the world that can reflect that. Yeah. <laughs> His re his reasoning at the time was he felt Kenshin deserved a better ending than what than that, and it it is appropriate timing to discuss something like this. And if, in fact, I actually planned it as such because about a month ago, give or take, there was a bit of a teaser for a new animation project within Roroni Kenshin's universe. And whether or not this was this is going to be an animation of the Jinshu arc proper, or an animation of the Hokkaido arc, is unknown at this time. I would like it. To, I would, if I'm being per, if I'm being perfectly honest, I would like the Jinshu arc to be animated, if only because that that would give a bit of closure, and. The Hokkaido, arc, the Hokkaido arc. I don't, I don't see enough of a reason to jump straight into that. I mean, we're not, we're not dealing with four kids bullshit or four K media or whatever they're calling themselves these days to avoid the tax. <laughs> but I do hope that whatever that whatever comes along in that in that form, that it's able to maintain it's able to maintain a good. Quality of quality of animation. At the very least, if it can be as good as the Orphan remake, I think we'll be in good hands. Just don't use this as an as an excuse to do the whole story all over again. There's way too much to cover on that, and nobody's gonna want that. However, I think th I I do think that anyone who once a once a good piece of a samurai tragedy should go through the OVA, because that's basically what this is. And in fact, this particular OVA got sh got shared a lot in the L5R um, forums that I w that I used to frequent. Not surprising. Oh, um, and got brought up again when when word got out about Tenra. Two ca hey. two games that I've talked about in some manner in the past here here in the temple, and one of which I did a full review on, though that review was in my old style when I was doing chapter-by-chapter chapter breakdowns. So, it's not up to my usual standards. Oh! Oh! Okay, I, f I found uh, the, full, the full release list from Discotech, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, as we mentioned, Astro Boy 80s, Simple Gear GX, um, Darkstalkers, and Kikaishi Fuse. But also Cyber City uh, OED0808, um, Double Dragon the Animated Series, Devil Man and Violence Jack, 
Uzumaki, Project Eiko 2, um, and Holmes of Kyoto as well. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there's just a bunch of stuff that they announced because... Discotech. That, com mm -hmm. that company deserves all the love. Yeah. Now, with that said, that will co that will cover our sophomore episode of the Parliament. Now, we w it, with the next project that we'll be covering, it will have a bit more runtime than this did, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be a long ass time before another episode. We'll have a little something in the interim that we've all watched and can easily rewatch. But that is a story for another time. So until then, this is this is the good this is the good brothers and sisters of the parliament, and as I always say, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>